Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amy Oberholzer, the Executive Director at Catch, and I'm very glad that you've joined us today for our second of four Lunch and Learn webinars we're hosting this fall. Today, Catch is very pleased to welcome back Erica Liebrandt of Sound Mind Counseling in Glenview. Erica will speak uh, for about a half an hour, a program entitled Helping Our Kids Understand and Overcome Social Anxiety. Following her presentation, we will take uh, questions. Please leave any that you have in the chat and we'll get to as many of them as we can. This presentation will be recorded and Catch will share across various platforms within a few days. We live in an increasingly socially anxious world made more challenging by the isolation of the pandemic and other societal trends. Erica will help us understand what social anxiety is, why it's important we help our kids overcome it, and just how to go about doing that. Erica Lee Brandt is a psychotherapist specializing in anxiety and depression. She was educated at Northwestern University and has been advocating for adolescents and teens for almost 20 years. Erica believes that communication with kids is the key in preventing debilitating mental health issues that compromise their quality of life. She's dedicated to helping families learn the right language to connect with their children, as well as providing other tools, insights, and resources to empower them. Erica is a kind and compassionate woman, and I personally value her knowledge and her heart very much. So I'm very happy to welcome Erica Lee Brandt. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. It actually warms my heart. Um, it, it's so wonderful to have the opportunity to speak here today on this extremely important subject that impacts more and more teens. Um, each year that goes by in my practice, I see an increase in social anxiety, not just in teens, but in adults as well. And actually a lot of the content Sorry if you lost me there. I don't know why I got muted. Uh, a lot of this content of the program today will be appropriate, not just for teenagers, but for adults dealing with social anxiety as well. So there will be takeaways for each and every person um, watching today. And hopefully you'll walk away feeling a little bit more well-equipped to deal with this um, fairly universal issue. How to help our kids understand and overcome social anxiety. Um, a socially anxious world, we are not imagining it. Social anxiety is on the rise. The National Institute of Mental Health in 2021 estimates that 9.1% of teens have social anxiety disorder. So that's not just social anxiety, which does occur like everything else on a spectrum. That's a clinical disorder. Um, so at 9.1%, you can imagine people who are just dealing with run-of-the-mill social anxiety is much higher. Um, according to the World Health Organization in 2020, 15 million adults have social anxiety disorder. Um, common outcomes if SAD is not addressed in teenagers, uh, low self-esteem, we see underperformance in athletics, academics, uh, employment, we see a lot of depression, um, codependent relationships. A lot of times a teen struggling with social anxiety will enlist someone to do the heavy lifting, the social heavy lifting for them. And we see lots of kids who, for example, uh, struggle to make a phone call or order food in a restaurant and they'll have an identified person to do those tasks for them, a parent or a friend or a sibling. Um, which deprives them of the opportunity to see themselves feeding at those tasks and building up um, the belief that they can do them. And then again, failure to launch, something we're seeing more and more of as the years go by. Uh, this is when emerging adults who usually are dealing with some level of social anxiety, if not other mental illnesses, um, kind of languish in the in-between phase between childhood and adulthood. And they remain dependent on caretakers when uh, ideally they would be getting, beginning to pass the, um, you know, the growth points towards adulthood. And it's a very difficult and challenging situation for parents and for their kids to navigate. 
So why social anxiety? Why, why is this happening? Why is it increasing? Um, one of the things I really enjoy talking about with kids is why social anxiety makes sense. Uh, when, you, when you make sense of it for them, it seems, it seems much more manageable almost immediately. And the reason that social anxiety makes sense is because there's an evolutionary element. Uh, human beings evolved to find safety in groups. Right. And so being a, integrated into a group really ensured that we would be protected from danger. And the opposite is also true, where if, if somehow we're excommunicated from a, a group, we're immediately in a great deal of danger. So I like to talk about to kids about the fact that their response, their social anxiety response, which is really a fight or flight response, it's a neurological response. Um, it isn't stupid. It doesn't mean they're weak or weird or anything else. It makes absolute sense, evolutionarily speaking. And then I like to explain to them that because we know it's a fight or flight response, we also know some very practical ways to mitigate that, that kids, every single kid can learn and can use in real time in real social situations. Um, this won't come as a surprise to you, I'm sure, but technology plays a huge role. Um, and, and I would say that the increase of social anxiety has risen in tandem with the increase of the use of technology. Um, technology allows kids to um, avoid having one-on-one -on -one social interactions and instead just kind of hide out um, in a state of avoidance, um, unchallenged. And, and this, once again, deprives them of the opportunity to build self-confidence, to build social skills, and to understand that despite feeling a little bit uncomfortable, they can engage in a social interaction and survive it. Technology has really squashed um, the opportunities for that to happen for kids. It also creates a lot of social, social isolation. Um, bullying is a, is a huge deal. You know, bullying always has been around and it's always been a problem but it's been exacerbated by technology because now it happens in a whole extra domain. Um, and the thing about, especially social media is that everything on social media is distorted. It's curated. Um, it's, it's more dramatic than regular life. It's more perfect than regular life. And like bullying, it kind of takes on a life of its own and it makes interacting in a, in a normal kind of non-technological way seem ever more intimidating. Um, another thing that I really wanted to talk about was adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. Um, this is something that we therapists assess for. Um, and it's something that uh, I think over 60% of adults have one or more reported adverse childhood experience. And these can include, um, you know, having an, an addict in the home, having negligence in the home, dealing with the lower socioeconomic situation um, or, uh, you know, abuse. Um, this, this creates social anxiety because it's, it's very isolating. Um, and, and leaves kids feeling like no one will understand their, uh, their experience in the world um, and makes them want to close down and, and shut themselves off from other people. This is a huge, a huge factor when it comes to um, social anxiety. And then of course we have the pandemic and other forms of mass trauma. Uh, you know, we just six weeks ago had the, the Highland Park shooting right in our own backyard. Um, as well as uh, environmental instability. You know, the world is a scary place right now for, for all of us. And kids are reacting to that. Um, and it would be strange if we didn't see some change in, in the attitudes of children in response to the things that are going on globally. Um, and in fact, we are, and they deserve some extra support because of it.
social anxiety disorder symptoms. Um, so this is a, a unique, in some ways, men mental illness or mental challenge because the symptoms uh, occur across uh, mental, the mental, emotional, and physical domains. Um, so emotionally, what social anxiety is really about is fear, right? A fear of rejection, a fear of being judged, a fear of being cast out and alone. And again, being kicked out of the group and, and not having the safety of the group. Um, and that fear <laughs> creates um, what I call anticipatory and post-process rumination. That's like when you worry, worry, worry about what's going to happen uh, when you're about to interact with somebody and you know, what I'm going to say, what I'm going to wear, how is it going to be? And then you also kind of torture yourself after the event, you know, going over and over in your head, uh, what happened? How could I have done better? What should I have said differently? And it really can go on for, for hours and hours, if not days, just really torturing people who are having these kinds of thoughts. Um, and that's sort of along with catastrophic thinking as well. Feeling like if I don't do well in this social environment, um, it quite literally feels like a life or death situation. So in response to that, we have avoidance. You know, it's so scary. It's so unpleasant that my answer to this is to avoid it. And because of technology, that becomes easier and easier to do. Um, the physical symptoms are real. Uh, if your kid has these, they are not being, you know, they're, they're not overstating it. They're incredibly uncomfortable. Um, nausea, upset stomach, you know, our bodies really fear, feel this fear and, and react to this, this emotion. Trembling, sweating, or blushing. Um, we can have dizziness, lightheadedness, racing heart feeling like your mind has gone blank. Like you can't, you can't grab a hold of a word. Um, and then we have things like disassociation. This is when we actually feel like we're having an out of body experience. It's a terrible, terrible feeling because it's, it's as if you've lost all control over yourself or your ability to, to do anything. Um, and so it's no wonder that kids want to avoid feeling these ways. So not everybody is equally susceptible to this. If, if we all were, then every single person would have it, right? So who is more susceptible? Um, Dr. Thomas Boyce coined the phrase uh, dandelion versus orchid children. And orchid children I'll also refer to as highly sensitive people. Um, you know, dandelion kids, it's what it sounds like. They're they're, they're robust, they can kind of do well in any situation, any environment, just kind of toss them out there and everything is pretty, pretty okay. Um, but when we talk about orchid children, their nervous systems are actually, their neurological development is different from a dandelion person and they experience stimuli in a more intense way. And this in includes, um, or can include sensory stimuli, intellectual stimuli, other environmental stimuli, um, emotional, their own and other people's emotions. So this world is a pretty loud place. And if you're dealing with an orchid person or a highly sensitive person who through no fault of their own, let's say have absolutely no control over this, is perceiving things at a higher volume than other people, a natural instinct is to withdraw, to withdraw. And, and as, as it, as the withdrawal sort of eases the symptoms of social anxiety, it becomes reinforced that avoidance is the way to find um, some, some peace, some peace of mind from this, when in fact, nothing really could be further from the truth. So how do we help our kids? We, we know what we're talking about. Um, we, we're looking to short circuit a fight or flight response um, that, occurs from uh, a fear of rejection. How do we help our kids overcome this? So the first thing I always talk about this, regardless of the subject, um, and it's just as relevant here, every single parent needs to become a skilled listener. Um, we are not taught how to listen. 
And I would say uh, in this country, we don't listen very well, generally speaking, but we can because it's a skill that we can learn. So specifically to social anxiety, you want to intentionally connect with your kid and be the person your kid can trust, be the person your kid can talk to. And the way that we do that um, is to first slow down and create space. So um, we wanna intentionally find a time to address the topic of social anxiety with our kid. If you notice that that's something they're struggling with. So, you know, take your kid out to a coffee or lunch, uh, walk the dog, get your kid in a car. I'm sure you guys already know that's the best place to talk to a child. Like you're, you're both staring forward rather than each other. Uh, play a card game. Um, you know, any, any of those little things that cause a distraction are, are conducive to talking with a teen. So that's number one. Um, number two is to withhold judgment. So a lot of times we parents are waiting for an opportunity to make a point, right? And we wanna just like jump in there and explain our point of view and kind of fix the problem. Um, and while there's a time and a place for that, uh, it's often counterproductive. And so we wanna withhold judgment. We wanna hold back on whatever it is we wanna say and just kind of clear our minds so that we can, we can receive whatever our child's experience is um, and, and have them feel heard. So then we reflect, we get our kids talking, a miracle, right? Sometimes we get our kids talking um, and then we just wanna, without adding or subtracting anything from what they're saying, just try to reflect it back to them and then ask them to clarify. You know, I think I heard you saying this, does that sound right? Um, now, the next one, name emotions, I think this is one of the most important skills that parents can learn. Um, it, it sounds weird and artificial, but this is, a, this is a, a very impactful thing that we can do with our kids. So let's say, for example, you're having a conversation, social anxiety, yes, it's terrible, I don't want to go out with my friends, it feels bad when I do. Okay, as a parent, you say something along the lines of, Wow, you sound really frustrated uh, when you talk to me about this. I wonder, I wonder if you're frustrated. And a kid might say, you might say yes, or might say, no, you know, no, no, that's not really it. And then you can keep trying and say, well, maybe it's more sadness that you're feeling. Is it sadness? And as soon as you name the right emotion, you're gonna see a complete shift in your child's body language, the shoulders drop face softens and you'll know you got the right, the right, um, the right thing. And so what you're actually doing in that moment is you're helping develop your child's emotional intelligence, because by naming that emotion, you're helping them develop that prefrontal cortex that's responsible for emotional intelligence. And you're also modeling the behavior of naming and accepting emotions. So that is a huge thing to do when you're trying to connect on any subject, including social anxiety. Then after you get everything kind of established, you wanna summarize what the conversation was about, and then you can ask questions. Um, and this is key because this is where you can figure out how, how can I help, what can we do? You can ask questions like, you know, do you think this is really impacting your life in a negative way? Um, do you think you could feel better than this? Um, do you think compared to other people, your social anxiety is about normal? Do you think it's a little worse, a little better? What do you think? Um, you know, and if we were able to make this better, would you be willing to consider, you know, whatever maybe might have, might work, might have worked for other people? So ask those questions. Um, and this is not a one and done conversation. This is something that you can, that you can do um, over you know, a course of days or weeks and just kind of gently get in there. You have to be artful. You know, teens are so mercurial. It's hard to pen them down sometimes, but we have to keep trying. So these are sage words from my mom, a very wise woman. Um, and this is something I always talk to kids about uh, who have SAD. And that is everyone in the room is thinking about the same thing and that's themselves. You know, kids in particular, 
feel that the spotlight is always really focused on them. Um, and, and we all adults, hopefully we all know this now that, that that's just not the case. Um, so while we adults know this, it feels pretty revelatory to kids to have someone point it out to them. Um, and it's, it's really worth, it's really worth taking some time to focus on this idea with them. So there are some very practical skills that interrupt this neurological response I keep talking about, this fight or flight reaction to socialization or the idea of socialization. And one of them that I really, really like because it's, it's invisible, it's useful in pretty much any situation is this Navy SEAL breath. This is actually used by Navy SEALs. I know because my brother's in the military, um, but it's, it's, used, it's used by more people than that. Um, it's also called uh, a box breath. Um, and it's, I learned it not from Navy SEALs, but from my decades long um, yoga practice. And the thing about doing breath work is that it's impossible to be in an activated or deregulated uh, neurological response while you're breathing in a controlled fashion. So the two can't coexist. Therefore, you can short circuit your, your anxiety by doing something like box breath or Navy SEAL breath. So I thought we would just take a couple of breaths together right now. And you can see for yourself um, and this is something that before I start, I want to say it's imperative not just to teach your kids this, but to practice it with them once a day, ideally. It takes 10 seconds or less, but if it isn't practiced, then it doesn't become integrated and kids don't have it as a resource or a tool when they need it because they're, they're you know, so activated, they can't access it. So it's very important to practice this with your kid, you know, in the morning, at bedtime, um, once a day, once every other day for a few months. Um, and, then, and then it should be integrated and then sort of do re little refreshers. And it's good for everybody. So it's good for you too. So the first step in this is just to find a, you know, yourself comfortably seated and then you can relax your face. Um, soft focus on the eyes, or you can close your eyes entirely. And if you're in public, you can just kind of secretly do those, those first steps. Just relax. And then we're going to inhale through the nose to a count of three. Pause. And then exhale through the mouth to a count of six. Pause, inhale, three, pause, exhale, six, pause, inhale, three, pause, exhale, six, Pause, last one. Inhale, three. Pause. Exhale, six. Pause. And then release. So for those of you who chose to do this along with me, you will notice that in a few short seconds, your, your, the energy in your body has shifted pretty noticeably. Um, and that is what we're looking for. That is the uh, impact we're looking to, to have on someone who's very elevated and, and deregulated. We have some other ways to do it though, too. So, you know, one might appeal to somebody for no other reason than it does or another. So all of these things are good things to teach your kids and then see which one resonates with them. And um, some are more fun, some are more silly. Um, appropriate for all ages though, really truly, like from, from three all the way through to you know 83, appropriate. Um, if you're in a situation you can tell your kids where you can feel the social anxiety coming on, you connect to your five senses. Same thing, it short circuits the fight or flight response. 
So think of one thing you can touch, one thing you can see, smell, taste, hear. Have them run through the five senses. It has an immediate calming effect. Uh, feet on the floor. You guys can do this with me right now too. Just feel your feet connecting to the floor. I usually talk about the four corners of the feet. And it takes your focus off of all of this noise in your head and it makes you feel immediately more grounded. There's squeeze and release. And you can do this um, with just your hands or you can do this with your whole body. That's more if you're just sort of by yourself in your room and you're feeling overwhelmed by anxiety. But if you're out in public, you can just sort of covertly squeeze your hands, squeeze, 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 and then release. And noticing the state between complete tension and then relaxation often helps to, to lower the mood. Um, tree pose, more yoga. Um, this is really just about standing up straight. So we can teach kids, studies show that if we stand up straight, it has immediate, an immediate, uh, it's an immediate mood booster to just lift the crown of our head, drop the shoulders, engage the core. Um, and if you do that again, right now with me, you'll feel a shift in your, in your internal energy. It's pretty remarkable, I think. It's so simple, so simple. Um, and then we have take a break. My favorite one, um, I have social anxiety too. So all this stuff is stuff that I actually do myself and I've, I've worked with many kids and my own kids with it. Uh, take a break is the master of social anxiety handling tools. Um, you know, we're overwhelmed. Everything's just, it's fl we're flooded with emotion, with fear, anxiety, you know, head to the bathroom, time out, um, teach your kids. It's okay to go and, um, just take a breath, take a breath. Um, Catherine Parker, I will get to that. I will get to that. I promise. Um, sorry, I got distracted, lost my train of thought. All right, I'm back. Um, how to handle the vortex, social media and video games. I would be remiss if I did not address this. Oops, can we go back a slide? There we are, thank you. Um, because technology plays such a huge role in um, social anxiety, we really need to address that specifically. Um, and a few of the ways that I think we need to do that are to get involved. And what I mean by that is have conversations, not just about social anxiety, but have conversations about um, what platforms your kid is using. What do they see on that platform? What do they enjoy? What do they not like about it? You know, ask questions, do your listening skills. And so you, so you are, you know, abreast of their experiences because they're spending a lot of time on social media and, and video games. So we want to know what they're doing from them firsthand. Um, use apps to control social media use. There's a great one called Bark, and it allows you to turn off um, uh, social media platforms from your phone at will. And so I think it's really important that we parents create an expectation um, that there won't be continual access to social media or video games. There's going to be limitations. These are these will be the limitations. You know, explain it in advance. Just it doesn't. It shouldn't be all kind of willy nilly. Um, and and stick to it as a parent. Sometimes that's the hardest part, is sticking to the mandate. Um, putting the internet to bed. I think this is important for everybody. Um, you can get a timer and you can put it on your Wi-Fi connector and you can shut the whole house down at 10 or 11 o'clock or something like that. If you're a parent who has a job or some, some kind of obligation that um, you need to stay online, then I would recommend bringing a kid's phone into the, into the bedroom, like they turn in their phone at night. Um, you have to stay consistent with this. Kids, the younger you start, the easier it will be. Um, but even if they give you a lot of pushback, you know, we're not our kids' friends. I know we want them to like us and love us, but we have to take a hard line on, on these issues of, of social media and technology, um, have dedicated screen-free time every day, hopefully some time spent outside too. Kids are not outside enough 
we got to get them outside. We got to get them off the screens. Um, make sure, you know, for it, maybe not a whole family meal, because Lord knows everyone has practices and they're going a million different, different directions, but maybe just sit down together and, um, you know, have a glass of tea or, or whatever it is, dedicated screen-free time every day. And then we also want to track time spent online. Um, I've worked with a lot of kids who were actually appalled when they saw the numbers of the time they were spending online. So there's, there's apps for that as well. Um, when kids are faced with the cold, hard truth of, of the hours they're investing online, either in video games or social media, it can really be quite a wake-up call for them. Here's something I know. Social anxiety must not go unchallenged or it is guaranteed to escalate. Promise you, it will escalate. Um, so we need to take every opportunity to help our kids engage. And we have to be more forthright about it than our own parents were, right? Because they weren't up against this technology piece. They, they just weren't. So back in the day, we kind of had to socially interact. And now kids kind of don't, right? They really can get through their lives without ever leaving a room, which is frightening and true. So any opportunity that we have to encourage our kids um, to, to participate in sports or clubs, music, art, um, re initiating contact with a friend. A lot of times kids with social anxiety struggle with initiating contact um, and, and really pushing them and helping them push themselves. Uh, every chance that we get, we have to remain vigilant. But if that doesn't work, and I think this is the question that, that was, was just asked, what do we do if our kids are so resistant that they refuse to engage in any of these things that we wish they would? What, what do we do then? So that is when your kid's social anxiety feels out of control, when, when there may be a school refusal and there, there is uh, maybe even violent outbursts and pushback, um, just an absolute lack of compliance with any kind of socialization that you suggest, an unwillingness to talk about it, to act on it. Um, listen, if you're a parent who's listening to this right now, please know you're not alone. Lots of parents are going through this with their kids and it's absolutely devastating for them. And there's, there's, there are things that you can do. Um, and, and these are some of them, some of my favorites. Um, one is experiential therapy. So that means, you know, typically we think of therapy as being talk therapy. We sit in a room, we talk and that's awesome. That's great. It's what I do. It's what I love. But talking about social anxiety at a certain point becomes unproductive. You have to behave your way through social anxiety. Um, so experiential therapy gives some opportunities to a client to, you know, walk down the street and see people or walk into a bank and have a conversation with a teller. Uh, my colleague, Kelly Scafitti, who I think I saw sign in uh, today. And if you are here, Kelly, thank you for joining. Um, does exactly that uh, with, you know, really good success. It, it teaches, it gives kids, again, the opportunity to observe themselves succeeding in a social interaction so that they can build that social muscle and, and learn that they can survive to feel some measure of discomfort. Um, we have progressive exposure therapy. This is really appropriate when, um, social anxiety starts to feel like a phobia. Uh, exposure therapy is, is a, a standard treatment and a, and a very good treatment for phobic um, people. Um, and what it does is it starts out at the, the very tiniest thing. Like let's say you show a client a picture of two people interacting and um, you build the exposure to socialization from there. Uh, and usually that's a six to 10 week program uh, that has really good efficacy and scientific research to back it up. So I, I think that's a great approach. We have CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. This helps kids challenge unhelpful thoughts, reframe unhelpful thoughts, 
and challenge unhelpful behaviors. It's very targeted. Um, it's pretty easy to find a CBT uh, oriented therapist or someone who uses CBT as an adjunct to some other modality these days. And then really actually my favorite is probably group therapy and it makes sense, right? Because kids have to interact in a group um, and they do it with a professional clinician uh, in the room who can help interpret social, social cues and um, encourage appropriate socialization. Really powerful way to go. So the, the sum total of what I'm talking about is that social anxiety is a neurological reaction to stress that can be managed through cognitive reframing like explaining to kids you're not you're not the sole focus of somebody in a room or cognitive reframing in a clinical setting which gets more in depth and detailed skills building like the navy seal breath tree pose and so on and exposure making sure your kids either in a clinical setting or just in a typical social setting actually build that social muscle and if you do those things on whatever level makes sense for the degree of social anxiety that your child has, they can feel and do better. I've seen it. Um, I was just saying to Amy in the group, uh, I worked with a kid with severe social anxiety um, and just uh, we stopped our work about a year ago and he just went away to college and I, I checked in with him to see how college is going. And I was delighted to find that he's still using the skills that we worked on and he's doing, he's doing great. He's living on his own. He, he's making friends, um, you know, participating in activities at his school. It really was remarkable. So I, I have seen lots of concrete evidence that these ideas do work um, if, if you apply them. So now I'm ready for some questions. Oh, no, sorry. I wanna talk about resources first. Just kidding. Um, all right, so just real fast, because I know we're running short on time, but Social Anxiety Workbook, the Shyness and Social Anxiety Workbook, this is a, this is a great one. Um, it's recommended uh, pretty routinely by psychiatrists. That's how I found out about it. Um, it was a psychiatric recommendation. And it's, it, it's essentially, it gives you the opportunity to apply uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, skills yourself with your kid, it's great. The highly sensitive person, if you or your kid is a highly sensitive person, this book is for you. It will help you understand exactly how you're built and how to maximize your experience in the world. De-escalate. I want every parent in the world to read this book. This book tells you how to develop the best listening skills possible. It was actually developed by Douglas Knoll um, as a as a response to a study he did trying to help violent offenders um, speak calmly to one another. And ironically, it's even more helpful in my opinion to use with teens. Um, we have the ACE questionnaire, so you can check for adverse childhood experiences. Uh, Bark is the website that I talked about that will help you control social media. Um, if you want to get, if you want to do your own assessment on how bad your kid's social anxiety is, so you can kind of determine whether you want to take them in for clinical treatment or not, we have the um, the bottom there. Could your generalized social anxiety scale for adolescents? Very helpful. Very helpful to um, understand what's going on. And then we have breath work for more ideas um, uh, to help your kid um, use skills to re-regulate their nervous system. Um, I will stay 10 minutes after because I've run so long. If anyone does have more questions than we're able to answer by one o'clock, I'd be happy to do that. Thanks so much, Erica. Um, we did get some questions in before today's event. If you guys have any um, additional ones, please put them in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, I, I see the questions kind of in a bunch of different categories, more, um, general questions about social anxiety. We've got some specific questions from folks about their um, child in particular. So I think we'll start off with this one though. Um, Erica, can you speak a little bit more to the difference between shyness mm. 
social anxiety and what would be, you know, sort of an escalation of that that would look more like a phobia, a social phobia? How can one tell what they're seeing in their kid? You know, that's a really good question. And I don't think you always can tell the difference between shyness and social anxiety. Um, shyness, I think, is something that um, you see right at the beginning, right, right when a child is very small. Um, and, and it's not something that's in response to having been bullied or, or, you know what I mean? Like social anxiety kind of evolves a little bit later, in my opinion, whereas shyness is something we see straight out of the gate as soon as a child is interacting um, with, with adults. But I don't know if the, I don't know if the difference is all that important um, because the way that I would handle each would be very similar. A shy person, like a person with social anxiety, needs to be encouraged to interact, needs to see themselves succeeding in social interactions in order to feel as confident as possible um, moving forward. So, so I, I think there is a difference. It's hard to articulate, I will admit. Um, but I think the way that we the way that we respond to it should be similar. And in terms of how do we know what we're looking at, I, for me, it's more about figuring out the intensity of the issue rather than the name of the issue, right? So if somebody is so shy, they they cannot bring themselves to interact. That's something that probably you know would benefit from a clinical intervention. Um, if they just feel uncomfortable, but they can push through, then that's something they can probably handle on their own. And I would say the same thing about social anxiety disorder. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds as though it's a severity kind of thing and yeah. something that you see develop rather than something that might be more inherent in what, who their kid is. Yes. Um, one of the questions we got, and I think you did a really nice job today in helping us as parents understand things that we can do to help our kids. Um, but one of the questions we got was, what about the fact that kids these days are leaning on and learning so much more from their peers hmm. than their parents or mentors? Can you speak to how we can encourage our kids um, to deal with their social anxiety or their social phobia when they're leaning so much into their peers? Hmm. Well, I don't know if they're leaning more into their peers than ever before. I think, you know, parents still have a very strong voice and an influence in our children's lives. And, you know, I, part of what we what we have uh, as a responsibility as parents is to be a powerful force in our children's lives and not be overshadowed um, by what's going on with with their peers. Uh, and, and I really think because a lot of that is happening online, what I was talking about in terms of limiting and managing uh, their presence online is a big piece of that. Um, you know, we have a strong and powerful impact on our children as parents, uh, and and we need to own that and and really come forth and stand in our own power. It's not always easy to do, <laughs> but I agree. With none you. of none of what I'm talking about is easy to do, and if no. it was easy, we wouldn't be here talking about it. And I and I realize they these are real challenges. I don't mean to sound dismissive, um, but but it's important to remember as well that we do have power. We 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 do, and we must is sort of what you're saying. I think we right? must. Yes. Um. Can my child's resistance to being social or going to social events be an act, a coping mechanism of sorts? Absolutely. Like a pro they're protecting themselves yes, from yes. you know, being hurt, feeling left out, et cetera. So where is that line between good for you for protecting yourself and mm -hmm. You got to get out there. It's important for you not to let this escalate into something really debilitating. Yeah, I love that question because it really it shows a great deal of insight into what social anxiety is. Social anxiety is is absolutely a way for kids to protect protect themselves from pain, right? Like if I don't interact socially, then I don't have to feel uncomfortable or feel all these terrible sensations associated with social anxiety. So the first thing you do is you tell your kid. 
I get it. I, I know that's why you're making this choice. But the second thing you tell them is if you keep making that choice, you're going to make things worse for yourself rather than better, because you're not going to give yourself the opportunity to, to grow in ways that will diminish your discomfort in these situations. And that is hard for kids because it, it requires a longer term view, right? Which kids don't have because their brain development isn't there yet. So we have to see around that corner for them and explain to them what, what, the, what the risks and rewards for that self-protective behavior are. That's always my, uh, my challenge as a parent is to say, I've been around the block a few times. <laughs> I really do have some insight here. Yeah. You know, you just have to kind of keep gently reminding them, right? And that's, it is, it's a war of attrition. That's the thing. And, you know, we parents say we're really up against something no one's ever been up against before. So we're all learning this together. We're all in this together, kids and parents alike. And we're really, sometimes we're just, we're just out there fumbling around in the dark. Me too, doing the best that we can. Um, but it's a war of attrition in the sense that we can't just have one conversation. We have to keep talking, keep that dialogue going, keep working on your own listening skills, and also keep working on modeling behavior that you want to see in your kids and yourself. You know, you're the strongest, despite peers, I get peers are very important, but you are the strongest role model in your child's life. And so the more together you are, the more okay, they're going to be. Erica, we've had a number of questions about um, social media, video, phone. I'm going to come back to those in just a minute because I think this is an important question that might encapsulate a lot of what you've talked about. Uh, it reads, this summer, my daughter, who is 20, seemed moody and grumpy every time I talked to her, so I gave her a lot of space. But she recently told me that, in fact, she has been feeling anxious and depressed. And I, I feel badly that I didn't see it. I wrote it off as sort of a typical teen when I should have been working to build connection. Mm -hmm. How do I tell the difference and how, you know, far do I push in? Well, first of all, forgive yourself for making a mistake. Um, you know, that this is, this is a great question too, because I think uh, all of us parents really struggle with this. Like how, how hard do I push? When do I, when do I pull back? And, you know, there's no, there's no across the board answer for that. It's really about your kid and just using your, your intuition to the best of your ability, keeping the door open. Like, even if they keep slamming it in your face, keep opening it gently, um, you know, and, and Try to create those places for conversation. And if they keep pushing back on you, you can always say, you know, you can ask them, what would help you right now? What would help you right now? And a lot of times they'll just be like, oh, just leave me alone or just stop bothering me. Be like, okay, I will stop bothering you right now, but I'm going to come back like tomorrow and bother you a little bit again. So, you know, if you want to talk to me, then I'll be there. So just kind of a little light, you know, just give them a little give them a little pushback. Um, and, and so they know like you're not checking out, they can't completely push you away. You got to keep the door cracked just a little, little bit. Right. So they know you're on the other side of it. So better to err on the side, almost of too much reminder that I'm here rather than in a light way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just in a very brief, you know, I'll be up here and you can slam the door in my face tomorrow kind of a way. <laughs> Don't forget the humor, right? <laughs> humor is key. It's essential. <laughs> um, how do you guide your child if you struggle to some degree with shyness or social anxiety? Man, if, you're, if you have it and your child has it, that child is in luck because you <laughs> understand. You understand what they're going through. And you can talk to them about it from a really personal place. Uh, and I would advise doing that. Just be like, you know, I struggle with this. And, you know, some of the things I've done to, to help myself have worked and others haven't. And you can use that as an entry point for lots of great conversations. Um, and, and really think about what has worked for you and what hasn't worked for you. And you can share that. Um, you know, you probably have more insight than someone like me does in, in a certain level, because this is your child and you both share the same um, attitude. 
Um, I, I would I would be very open and transparent with my child that I am dealing with the same thing, not to put the focus on me, you know, just briefly say, yes, I deal with this too. And I think you might feel this way. Does that sound right? So I don't suffer from social anxiety myself, but I would assume that it's similar to other kinds of anxiety, which is that once you sort of do do it, push yourself, get to the other side, there's a sense of calm or relief. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to so say much. no, no, because the problem, the problem with social anxiety is that the post rumination that I was talking about before. Okay. So, so you, you, you kind of get all amped up prior to a social interaction. And then you, you have all the terrible physical symptoms during the social interaction. And then afterward, you, you have to process everything that happened. So the only way that those, those things lessen is by doing it more and more. And then over time, your, your rates of success go up and your belief that you can comfortably do these things increases. Um, and you know, a lot of people with social anxiety will always have a measure of it. Um, and, and that's maybe just something like about yourself that you have to accept. I will always have a little piece of social anxiety and I can, I can deal with it. I can be uncomfortable and I can still live and survive. Uh, I want to get back to a couple of these social media questions that came in um, today following your comments. Um, what would you recommend to track video game and social media time? You know, I have to I have to look up the exact app for that, but there is one and it's Google Googleable. I meant to do that before we met today. Will you share that with Catch and we can push that out to the audience? Yeah, of course. Okay, that would be great. And yeah. I also wanted to mention um, to everyone that the resources that Erica shared at the end of her presentation, uh, we will also make available to all of you um, who are here today and to the Catch audience. Um, one more along these lines, Erica, how would you transition or how do you transition control of the phone to growing teenagers before they head off to college? Hmm. Great question. Um, you know, it's such an individual, it's, it's, this is such an individual thing because some kids really are good about monitoring um, their own behavior on phones. Some, some kids are great about it. Um, and they and they choose to stay off of it. Other kids are absolutely addicted to it. So I, I'd say the first step is to evaluate what is your child's relationship with that phone, um, and you know, kind of by the time they're going to college, it's a little bit too late, I guess, because you've you really have lost the ability to control how they use the phone. Um, but I would, the, at the very least, uh, have a conversation with them, um, and tell them, you know, even though you're gone, I'm still, I still have the ability to, and I should and will shut down social media apps during certain hours of the day. Right. So just not as a punishment, but just setting an expectation that during those hours of the day, this is not going to be what you're doing. Um, I think I would start there. Uh, it, again, once our kids turn 18 and go to, go to college, we really, our, our role as a parent has to change. We, we cannot exert the same level of control over them as we used to, um, where once we we're parenting, now we're kind of just guiding and advising. Um, so to follow up on that, um, I think this question goes very hand in hand. How can I help my college son guide my, my college son? Uh, to go into the career center and ask for help with interviewing. He is afraid of looking or saying something stupid mm -hmm. and doesn't want to utilize that resource. Good question. You might not be able to. This might be something he has to figure out on his own. I mean, you, if, if he's away at school, this is, this is why kids go to school so that they can make their own mistakes and make a decision not to go to the reason. I mean, maybe I'm giving the wrong answer here, but I mean, you just really, as a parent, kind of have to let your kid fumble around a lot when they get to school. And all you can do is make suggestions. 
once once college happens, we need to take a step back. And if we haven't prepared our kids for for what's happening in college, or they're just they they haven't grown um, in the way that we would have hoped, you know, they're going to grow once they're away. Um, so I would just encourage him and keep encouraging him. And if he doesn't do it, then he'll have to learn how to do it in a different way or fail and decide to do better later. One thing that has not worked for me as the mom of a college daughter is to keep asking over and over again. Yeah, it doesn't work. That's right. Uh, she's reminded me more than once that if I ask her so many questions every time we're on the phone, she won't call anymore. <laughs> She'd and, rather just have a conversation. Um, yeah. You so. have, to, you really have to hold those reins loosely. And I know, you know, I just, I just sent my youngest, my youngest uh, off to college for the first time. And so I'm going through this myself right now as well. Just, you know, realizing that my role, no matter how well or ill prepared he is, my role has to change now. Um, he's out of the nest and he has to spread his little wings, you know, and if he doesn't manage to get him out in time, he's going to fall on his face. And that's part of growing up. And I guess if the connection is there, he'll ask you for help when he needs it. That's what yeah. we all hope, right? Yeah. yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Um, one more question or a few more came in from the audience today, I guess. Um, can you just briefly say who or where does progressive therapy and can any therapist do ACE testing? Um, or maybe that's something we could share after today's webinar. Yes, I can. So progressive exposure therapy is what they're asking about. Mm -hmm. I can, I can find resources for that for sure that we can share afterward. And as far as any therapist doing ACE testing, um, yes, any therapist that is uh, licensed has the ability to do an ACE assessment. So we'll, we'll get you the places that offer progressive exposure therapy. I know Rogers is one of them, isn't it, Erica? Um, I'm not sure, but I okay. will. Find um, yeah, we will provide that information to you um, after the webinar today. So we have time for maybe one or two more questions, and then we will wrap it up today. Before we do that, I want to mention um, kind of as a way to wrap up this whole social media screen time conversation that our next webinar, our next Lunch and Learn from Catch, uh, we'll be addressing um, transitions, tech transitions. We're going to talk to Kevin Lanham um, next month. I think it's the 11th of October, but we'll put up a, um, our final slide today will be about that webinar. So we're going to continue this conversation about screen time and managing transitions from screens um, next month. Um, Let's see, we have a, a number of questions that came in early today. I'm not exactly sure which ones we should get to here. Um, let's do this. My child was experiencing a lot of social anxiety last year and was resistant to participating in anything. Now the pendulum has swung the other way hmm. and they're jumping into everything. And I feel like it's too much. How can I help her find balance without second guessing or discouraging them? Hmm. Well, first of all, I'd say that's amazing. And <laughs> I would be more happy than anything else. Um, I, I would want to ask this parent why she feels her life is out of balance. Does she feel like this over-involvement is anxiety driven? Um, you know, what, what's the downside of it? And, and I, my answer would sort of be in response to that. So that's, that's a tough question to answer broadly. But I, I will say that it's a really good problem for a parent with a socially anxious kid to have. Right. And now they just kind of have to figure out how to get back to sort of center. Yeah. I, I would say my instinct tells me that if she's doing that and she does, she, she had social anxiety in the past that she's probably going to even herself out on her own. Um, because if she is a highly sensitive person or her, her nervous system gets activated pretty easily, the over involvement is going to um, exhaust her. Uh, and so she'll probably back off on her own, I would imagine. Let's finish up today, Erica, with one more question. Um, we've spent a lot of time um, or a lot of our conversations been about fearing social situations or wanting to avoid social situations when anxiety 
gets the best of our kids. But what are some other ways that social anxiety might manifest itself that aren't as obvious? Are there other things that we should look for in our kids that might be indicative of the fact that social anxiety is taking its toll? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the one of the things I see a whole lot of is this this unwillingness to initiate um, with friends. Like, so you can have a, a kid, have your kid, and they have friends, and they do stuff, and so they're they're out and they're you know going to movies, and they're doing whatever but they're never initiating those interactions themselves. That is a huge problem because, it, and it's something I see a ton of, if, if a kid feels powerless to initiate a social interaction, even if they are socializing at other times, they are also feeling things like shame and um, powerlessness and feeling trapped. So that's something I would, I always look out for. Um, and then are there physical manifestations too? I mean, are there okay. things that our kids might complain about physically that would be indicative of social anxiety? Totally. Um, upset stomach is the big, big one. You know, if they feel nauseated or they can't eat or they, you know, their, their tummy hurts, um, huge, huge thing. Um, but anxiety is so crazy. It can, it can present in such myriad ways in the body, um, headaches, excessive sweating. You can even be feeling, you could experience anxiety, physical anxiety symptoms, and not even feel emotionally anxious. That's really bizarre too. Um, so, uh, if a kid gets rosacea, like if they're, if they start blushing or flushing, that might be enough to make them not want to socialize. So those visible, um, my older son had that where his cheeks would get very red and he was so embarrassed by it that he wanted to sort of hide away. Um, yeah. One thing I've learned is with teens, if they're complaining about something physical, a lot of the time it has to do with something emotional, right? So, so I always explore that avenue as an answer to somatic complaint. Erica, we've got to wrap it up. I feel like I could talk to you for the rest of the afternoon. I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate all of you who came today. Thank you for joining Catch. Thanks for being such a great community partner, Erica. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the, the opportunity. We will share this recording soon and we will share the resources that Erica shared with us as well. Um, thank you everybody for coming. And this is our next webinar, our next Lunch and Learn webinar, which will take place October 11th. Join us again. Have a great afternoon.